Take that. McMaster just silenced media with what Trump's really doing in Iran. Just days ago, Trump announced that he will not recertify Obama's shady Iran deal. Trump has said it's the worst deal ever, and he means it. But he's aware that because of where Obama put us, it wouldn't do us any good to simply trash the whole thing now. National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster has come out strongly in favor of Trump's announcement, saying it's making it possible for our allies and Iran to fix what's wrong with the deal. Here's Chris Wallace on General McMaster Prince. Uh, it's National Security Advisor General H.R. McMaster. General, take a little back bit. to Fox News Sunday. A uh, little bit of a look. It's an honor to have you. The president called this new strategy towards Iran a two-step process. Step one is withholding the certification, as you've done, uh, with an eye toward potentially securing some changes to the Iran nuclear deal and some changes in Iran's behavior outside of the deal. Step two, as the president made clear in the remarks we're about to hear, uh, is that if the first step doesn't work, we cancel the deal. In the event we are not able to reach a solution working with Congress and our allies, then the agreement will be terminated. So while we're in this first phase, seeking changes to the nuclear deal, uh, is it the policy of the United States government that we continue to implement fully all existing U.S. obligations under the deal? Yes, it is. And what the president, though, has done is he has set out a marker, a marker to the Iranians, and to our allies and partners that we have to fix fundamental flaws in this deal. It's a weak deal that is being weakly monitored. And so the president has made clear that he will not permit this deal to pro provide cover for what we know is a, is a horrible regime to develop a nuclear weapon. So two of the men uh, in government today, whom I think you most admire and respect, advise the president against making this decision. Iran is not in material breach of the agreement. And I do believe the agreement to date has delayed uh, the development of a nuclear capability by Iran. I believe at this point in time, absent indications to the contrary, it is something the president should consider staying with. And our allies have weighed in right about where you would have expected them to be, with Britain, France, and Germany issuing a joint statement. Uh, and I quote, we stand committed to the JCPOA, that's the technical name of the Iran deal, and its full implementation by all sides. Preserving the JCPOA is in our shared national security interest, unquote. So, General, isn't it farcical to imagine that the Iranians or the P5 plus one allies are going to be willing to revisit the terms of this deal? No, they, they already are revisiting the terms of the deal and the implementation of the deal. And our European allies, the E3 they're called, France, Germany, and the UK, are supporting much more rigorous enforcement of the JCPOA and monitoring. One of the real problems with this, with this deal is we can't really say with confidence that they're complying. And we know from their behavior, their behavior broadly in the region, and their behavior within the agreement, where they've walked up the line, they've crossed the line several times in terms of the restrictions, that this is not a trustworthy regime. So much more comprehensive monitoring is, is in order. What parts do you see the Iranians being willing to revisit? Well, it's not even revisit. It's just implement the agreement by going to, to sites, to, to, uh, to fully implement the inspections of sites, the monitoring of suspicious sites with, within Iran. The things you are find most objectionable about the deal, which is the restrictions on military sites for access for inspectors, uh, the sunset clauses, um, the Iranians are not going to revisit any of that, are they, willingly? Well, but they, they have to revisit it, because otherwise what you do is you just give the Iranians the opportunity to develop a nuclear capability. Their programs can advance, and then they can go to industrial scale enrichment of uranium within a very short period of time, and then bridge into a weapon. And that is just a, an unacceptable risk to isn't the world. That, isn't that precisely what they can do if you walk away from the deal? Well, the president's not walking away from the deal yet. So if he sees some real change, if he sees the, the, the ability of the Congress within U.S. law to address some of these problems associated with the deal. So this, in our legislation, the domestic law about the deal was really flawed because it was really just about us reporting to each other. So what the president has done is, is led with Congress to ask Congress, help fix this, this, this domestic legislation, and, and let's work on, as Secretary Tillerson has said, 
a deal that can lay alongside the JCPOA and address its fundamental flaws, one of which you've already mentioned, which is this sunset clause, where Iran can just wait for a little while, reap all the benefits of sanctions relief to enrich the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, which is on a murderous, brutal campaign across the Middle East. And then get enriched into a nuclear weapon. Which was designated as part of this initiative, correct? Because I think what's really important about the President's speech is to pay attention to the whole speech. Because what the President has done is he has laid out a strategy for dealing with Iran's destabilizing and dangerous, hate-filled behavior. It's behavior toward its own people, and it's behavior to the region. I would ask, as we always pay attention to our European allies and others, pay attention to our allies and partners in the region. What they've said, the people who are under the gun of this regime, Israel and Saudi Arabia in particular. All right, let's turn to a country that many believe Iran has actually been helping advance towards a nuclear weapons capability, and that's North Korea. The Stalinist regime in Pyongyang this past week reissued its threat to move militarily against Guam, a U.S. territory. We have heard you and the President and others in the administration reaffirm many times that the so-called military option remains on the table. What would you like our adversary in this instance, Kim Jong-un, to know about that military option? Is it the same military option that was on the table when I used to hear Condoleezza Rice talk about it in 2005? Or has, in fact, the North Koreans' nuclear progress in that time served to constrain the military options that we have today? The President's been really clear about this. He is not going to permit this, this rogue regime, Kim Jong-un, to threaten the United States with a nuclear weapon. And so he is going to do anything uh, necessary to prevent that from happening. And what Kim Jong-un should recognize is that if he thinks the development of this nuclear capability is keeping him safer, it's actually the opposite. It, it's having the opposite effect. What about the military options? Are they the same ones we had in 2005? Well, they're under constant refinement. So we have a, a broad range of, of new capabilities coming into our, to our armed forces thanks to the president's focus on modernizing the armed forces, addressing what had been a bow wave of deferred military modernization. So our military is getting stronger and stronger, and our military leaders are refining, improving plans every day, plans that we, we hope we don't have to use, but we must be ready. We have to be ready. And so all of our armed forces are getting to really a high, high degree of readiness for, for, the, for this mission, if it's necessary. This tweet by President Trump instantly became one of his most memorable. It was posted just after 11 p.m. on the night of September 23rd. And it read, and I quote, just heard Foreign Minister of North Korea speak at UN. If he echoes thoughts of Little Rocket Man, they won't be around much longer. General, did you receive advance warning that that tweet was going to go out? Well, I, the president doesn't have to clear anything with me. Uh, but what, what the president's tweet is is very consistent with his policy. I think what's important to understand with both the Iran policy and with the North Korea policy, the president gave us very clear guidance at the outset. We delivered as the national security team, multiple options to the president. Had broad-ranging discussions. The president has made decisions on very coherent, well-laid-out strategies, I and wanna, that's what we're executing now. I want to ask about the tweet, though. Do you and the president proceed from a shared view that the public denigration of another head of state, uh, an attempt at publicly humiliating an adversary on the world stage with a derisive term like Little Rocket Man, that that can have some positive strategic impact? I think what the real danger is uh, in terms of communicating with Kim Jong-un is that he do if he doesn't understand how serious we are about the, his behavior and the behavior of the regime. And the president's been very clear on that, and I think that is, it's beneficial to the safety and security of not only the United States, but our great allies in South Korea and Japan and the world. All right, we just have about a minute left. I want to ask about your 1997 book, Dereliction of Duty, Johnson and McNamara, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Lies that Led to Vietnam. I was a big admirer of the book. It's a deep archival study of how the Joint Chiefs were systematically excluded from policymaking uh, in the process that gave us uh, the quagmire in Vietnam. You wrote at that time, those who questioned the direction of LBJ's policy were excluded from future del deliberations on Vietnam. The president got the military advice he wanted. So, having made wartime dysfunction on the National Security Council your area of academic study, how do you apply the lessons you learned about the process in the Vietnam era to the running of the National Security Council today? Well, it was a real gift to be able to study the National Security Council and decision-making within that National Security Council and with and interaction with the President from a historical perspective. 
And I think history can't give you the answer to today's problems, but it can help you maybe avoid some mistakes of the past. So it really highlighted for me what we owe the president within the National Security Council is to coordinate and integrate efforts across all our departments and agencies and provide the president with multiple options, options that are based on clearly articulated goals and objectives that we derive from an understanding of vital interests, with would U.S. vital interests. Any policy stakeholders with equities in the process today who would complain that they've been excluded in any way under H.R. McMaster? No, what, what we have done is we, have, we are running a fully transparent process that empowers the, the president's very talented cabinet to bring forward to him their best assessments and their best recommendations. What the president does is he has very tough questions. And I think you've seen this in the development of a broad number of strategies from Cuba to, to, North, uh, to North Korea to South Asia. And so what I think the president has done is helped us restore our strategic competence. He got the National Security Council out of the tactical day-to-day -day business and, and supervising cabinet officials who don't need supervision. They need, they need support and they need effort to help in integrating their efforts with others. We'll pursue all of this more with you the next time you come back here. Thanks. It was a privilege to be with you. Thank you. All right. And uh, it's the art of the deal, and our president truly makes it an art. If you're proud of our president, please share everywhere and comment. I agree with Trump's stance on Iran. Yeah, I do. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. And again, thank you so much for watching.